Representatives, Congressman Alfred Vargas from the 5th District of Quezon City. Congressman Vargas was recently honored as one of the outstanding young men of 2019 in the field of public service. He is the author of House Bill 3293, or an act establishing a national evaluation policy. Let us watch and listen to his message. Greetings of safety and good health. A pleasant day to all of you guys. It is an honor to be invited again by the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department or CPBRD to this uh, knowledge sharing forum on evaluating the Philippine Plan of Action for Nutrition or PPAN. The persistence and gravity of child malnutrition in the country is a growing concern for all of us, parents, legislators, policymakers, and Filipinos. According to, to the UNICEF, 95 children in the country die from malnutrition every day, while 27 out of 1,000 Filipino children do not get past their fifth birthday. Also, around 30% of children under the age of five are stunted or are short for their age. Sadly, this situation has shown little improvement in recent years. Aside from high rates of stunting and uh, neonatal deaths, low routine immunization coverage, and lack of access to clean water and sanitation facilities make life difficult for them. These statistics are heartbreaking manifestations of undernutrition in our children that we must stop. The call for us is to use effective and evidence-based programs and policies to address these alarming problems. This representation's proposed legislation House Bill Number 3293, which aims to establish a national evaluation policy in the country, will help us win the fight against malnutrition and answer the need for a better monitoring framework in our institutions. HB 3293 mandates the establishment of a national evaluation policy to strengthen the legal, an institutional framework for the regular conduct of monitoring and evaluation of the results of public policies, programs, projects, and other forms of government intervention intended to promote sustainable development and uplift the living standards of all Filipinos, especially the poor and the marginalized. The NEP will apply to all departments agencies, government-owned and controlled corporations, government financial institutions, and other instrumentalities of the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government. It will also cover all public policies, programs, projects, services, and other activities formulated and implemented by these agencies including those contracted to and executed, produced and delivered by the private sector and civil society organizations. Friends, today's knowledge sharing forum shall open the possibilities not only for better government programs and policies on nutrition, but also for the improvement of the living conditions of our children who will eventually take on the mantle of leading our country to progress. Para po ito sa ating mga anak, para sa kalusugan at sa kabataan na siyang pag-asa ng ating bayan. I look forward to a fruitful and healthy discussion amongst our notable speakers and guests. Thank you very much and mabuhay po tayong lahat. Stay safe always po. Thank you, Congressman Vargas, not only for advancing the children's nutrition agenda, but also for promoting evidence-based policymaking through your evaluation policy bill. 
Um, we're also supposed to hear the message of Senator Riza Ontiveros, but um, her staff has yet to send her video message. So maybe we will have to skip that and just play it later when it comes in. So now we proceed to the main event of this forum, which is the presentation on the evaluation of the Philippine Plan of Action for Nutrition. Our main presenter is Mr. Peter Sruji, the Senior Research Manager at Innovations for Poverty Action, or IPA, a nonprofit research and policy organization that discovers and promotes effective solutions to global poverty problems. Previously, Peter worked for the International Labor Organization as an impact evaluation specialist. He finished his master's his undergraduate degree rather in economics and international studies from DePaul University and his master's in development studies from the London School of Economics. Friends, let's give a warm virtual welcome to Mr. Peter Suruji. Peter? Thank you and thanks to the Senate Economic Planning Office and the, the House of Representatives uh, for organizing this event. Um, it's a privilege and an honor to join you all virtually today and present the findings of our research on the Philippine Plan of Action uh, for Nutrition. So, um, this study uh, was conducted by me and my colleague Jed, and our academic lead uh, was Peter Rockers from Boston University School of Public Health. Next slide, please. So what I'll be discussing today, first I'll briefly introduce uh, Innovations for Poverty Action, and then I'll get into the motivation and objectives of this research. Um, I'll describe kind of how we approach the research, the methods that we used, and the limitations that you should keep in mind as I present the results of the study. I'll then go into the findings and the recommendations of the study, um, and I'll, I'll base the findings around four main recommendations that we've made. And then I'll discuss some next, uh, next steps looking forward. So about IPA, uh, very simply put, we conduct rigorous research to promote evidence-based policymaking. Uh, when I say rigorous research, um, we, we specialize in conducting randomized controlled trials, which is really considered the gold standard for evaluating the, the impact of programs. But we don't just do research for the sake of research. We, we do this to really identify what are the most cost-effective programs that are really proven to improve the lives of the poor, and then we advocate for the scale-up of those programs through, through policies. Uh, next slide, please. You might need to click twice. Yep. One more time. So simply put, um, our, our mission, our, our vision is more evidence, less poverty. Next slide, please. So we've conducted over 900 studies in 52 countries across a range of sectors, including health, education, and agriculture. We have 23 country offices and the Manila office is actually um, our oldest office along with our Peru office. Um, all of our studies are headed by academics from leading universities, and we partner with organizations from the government, uh, from other NGOs, and the private sector. Next slide, please. Uh, so in the Philippines, just a sample of some of our partners, you'll see that um, the majority actually come from the government. So for this study, our partner was the National Nutrition Council. Um, we also have uh, a number of evaluations that we've done with the Department of Labor and Employment, as well as the DAR, DepEd, uh, Supreme Court, DSWD, uh, the Philippine Crop Insurance Corporation. Um, we actually just submitted a proposal for an evaluation uh, with the Department of Agriculture so I think the fact that we have so many partnerships with government is just a good indication of really the appetite there already is for conducting rigorous evaluations of their programs and the dedication to evidence-informed policymaking. Next slide, please. And you may have heard last year, uh, three economists whose work has been foundational to our approach uh, won the Nobel Prize in economics. And IPA's role was acknowledged by the committee where they said that we play a crucial role in assisting researchers to run and implement experiments 
throughout the world. Um, so these three economists, they founded actually our sister organization called JPAL, um, and they're quite literally our sister organization. Um, Esther Duflo, uh, one of the economists who won the prize is actually sisters with Annie Duflo, who is our executive director. Next slide. Okay, so now I'll be discussing um, the main motivation for this research and, and the objectives. So really the reason why we're doing this research is that there's, uh, sorry, can you go back one slide? The main, the main reason for doing this research uh, is really there's a high rate of stunting, as you may know, in the Philippines. So one in three children are stunted in the Philippines. Um, and, and this rate has really kind of persisted throughout time. And we wanna understand why is that the case? Uh, next slide, please. Um, so why focus on stunting? So I'm sure many of you are already familiar with the uh, problems around stunting. So it's a consequence of, of child malnutrition that, that can actually be addressed. Um, it leads to cognitive deficits. Um, that, that persist into adulthood. And this has really been well established by both international research and research that has been conducted um, in the Philippines. So those children who are stunted are more likely to drop out of school. They're less likely to perform well in school. And further down the line, they're less likely to get good jobs. Um, and, and this really leads to um, impacts on a national scale. So the UNICEF um, actually quantified the impacts of, of stunting in the country and found that productivity loss um, due to child undernutrition in general leads to about $3.1 billion in economic losses per year in the Philippines. So it, you can see it has consequences at the child level, at the household level, and at the national level as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so then why are we focusing on the PPAN? So as you know, nutrition um, policymaking and governance is really decentralized in the Philippines. And the PPAN provides a framework for improving Filipinos' nutrition status um, for all of those who are involved in, in decision-making around uh, nutrition programming and, and implementation. And within that, um, it has set specific targets for, for stunting and, and recommendations of programs to really reduce stunting in the country, uh, particularly uh, during the first 1,000 days of a child's life. Uh, next slide, please. So, so the objectives of this research is really to try to identify the challenges and bottlenecks that are faced in addressing stunting through the PPANS implementation. So we've seen that, you know, we've had this persistent rate of stunting in the country. And as a first step, we want to understand, okay, well, why is that the case? Where, where are we experiencing bottlenecks and challenges? Um, and that can then help provide direction and where to really focus our efforts going forward. And in, in those efforts, we should build evaluations uh, so that we can better measure how well we're doing in terms of achieving our intended impact. Next slide, please. So in terms of our methods, next slide. Um, I'd first like to zoom out a little bit and discuss what kind of evaluation is this. So there's um, many different components to program evaluation and each evaluation really answers a specific question. And I'm gonna to return to this slide uh, towards the end of the presentation when we talk about um, looking forward. But really this study, I think could be characterized more, more aptly as really a needs assessment because we're trying to understand what is the problem? What's keeping us from really uh, making an impact on, on the rates of, of malnutrition um, and of stunting in particular in the country? Uh, next slide. So how we approach this, it's a formative, primarily qualitative study where we conducted six case studies um, across six provinces and six municipalities across Luzon, uh, the Visayas, and Mindanao. Um, so we conducted primarily semi-structured interview with about 205 key policymakers, implementers, and beneficiaries. And this was done at the national levels, the regional, provincial, municipal, and barangay levels. Uh, we also did a review and analysis of administrative data and, and documents, such as nutrition action plans at each level, and we also looked a bit into Operation Timbang Plus, uh, which I'll talk about later. 
Um, for the analysis, we primarily did a qualitative thematic analysis where we uh, transcribed all the interviews and did a line, line by line coding using uh, qualitative software. Um, we also did some quantitative analysis. So we went to 13 barangays and we gathered data from the OPT plus, the annual weighing and measuring of, of children. Um, so we, we gathered that data, we encoded it and we matched it across three years from 2017 to 2019 uh, to create a panel data set and, and analyzed uh, trends in that data. And I'll discuss um, some of the findings of that in a bit. Uh, next slide, please. So before I begin discussing the results, um, it's important to also mention the limitations of the study. Um, so of course, with, with any um, qualitative study that we do, um, there's sample size limitations, right? So we're only looking at six provinces, six municipalities and 18 barangays. So in no way are we even pretending that this is a representative sample. Um, keep in mind that we did choose um, alongside with the, in cooperation with the NNC, areas where that were priorities for the PPEN, where there's a high rate of stunting um, and where various challenges are faced because that's what's going to really inform, um, it's going to form kind of what kind of challenges are typically faced. I think it's also important to remember that we can contextualize the findings from this study from other similar studies. And I know the World Bank alongside this study was also conducting one um, that was looking at similar issues um, I believe UNICEF has an ongoing study, and of course the FNRI um, has conducted many studies as well. Um, also, apart from the OPT plus analysis, remember that most of the evidence here is based on these qualitative interviews. So it's based on perceptions and experiences uh, gathered from qualitative interviews. Um, Although we, we did cross check the information by speaking to multiple stakeholders involved and, and try to validate the information we were gathering that way. Um, lastly, we conducted data collection in 2019 and it was a campaign period uh, right before the midterm elections. And so many LCEs were really busy campaigning. So there was really limited availability to interview them. So that's one last thing to keep in mind in terms of limitations. Okay, so now let's get into the findings and recommendations. Um, so I'm going to base these, um, these findings around four main recommendations. Next slide, please. So one um, is to strengthen the cre credibility of Operation Timbang Plus. The second is to sharpen messages around stunting to influence behavioral change. The third is to focus more efforts at the barangay level, which is really the primary site of nutrition programming implementation. And the fourth is to strengthen programs that address stunting. Uh, so let's get into strengthening the credibility of the OPT plus. Next slide. So those of you who are familiar of the OPT, um, familiar with the OPT plus, know that it's the annual weighing and measuring of children zero to five years old at the barangay level. And it's the most widely used and resource intensive and mini tool uh, used by LGUs. It's actually a really impressive effort um, that's exerted uh, by every barangay in the country uh, to measure each, children, each child between zero and five years old. And, and this is actually not a common thing that's done in a lot of countries. So um, I really commend all those that are involved in, in this effort. Um, and it's a really powerful tool. Um, the reasons that it's, it's powerful is one, um, it can really be used to target our programs. So um, through the OPT, we can identify malnourished children to be recipients of nutrition programs. It's also used for budget allocation for policymakers. So it gives policymakers a sense of where more resources are needed to address malnutrition. Um, it's also used uh, for monitoring and evaluation. So it can allow LGUs to really monitor and measure progress and really follow a, a data-driven approach um, in terms of how they implement their programs and how they uh, formulate their policies. And, and lastly, it can be used um, as a, uh, for outcome-based incentives. So some of you might know that the National Nutrition Council um, has its annual MELPI awards that it uses to really incentivize uh, good performance in terms of nut uh, nutrition programming and implementation. And, and one of the many metrics that they use 
um, is um, the, the stunting, uh, rates of stunting that are gathered from the, the OPT plus. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of our findings, so those of you that are really familiar with OPT plus, um, there, there is a widespread perception that it's, it's plagued by a number of data quality issues. And, and these are some of the most common issues that were reported to us. Um, one had to do with training uh, and that uh, related to those that are really implementing um, uh, the OPT, uh, particularly barangay nutrition scholars, barangay health workers. Um, they're not always properly trained um, and don't always properly weigh and measure children. Um, a recent study from the FNRI, um, I believe it was conducted in Mindoro, um, it underestimated, it found that the OPT underestimates stunting and wasting. In terms of equipment, uh, one thing that was commonly reported was the precision of instruments that are used were called into question. So ideally the, the weighing and measuring of children would be done in the clinic but many times uh, mothers don't bring their children to the clinic. So uh, the BNSs and BHWs have to do actually household visits and they have to carry height boards and weighing scales that can be quite heavy and, and difficult to transport. Uh, notably many times they, they refer to it as kind of bearing the cross as they carry these height boards uh, long distances. And because they're, they're so difficult to, to transport, especially when they're trying to reach remote areas, they might bring other instruments like measuring tape or a bathroom weighing scale that is definitely less, uh, not as precise as these other instruments. In terms of coverage, uh, it was often reported, although many uh, LGUs actually exerted a lot of effort to reach remote areas, they still reported difficulties in reaching these areas to, to measure these children. And these are also areas where malnutrition, malnutrition is, is likely a problem, that there's usually access issues for those living in these remote areas. Also in our analysis of the OPT plus data, we found that in a given year, about 30% of targeted children were missing from the OPT. And if you remember, this is kind of one of the primary ways that LGUs really target children. Um, if 30% are missing in a given year, you could imagine that you know, those children actually aren't receiving um, the programs that they should be targeted for. And then lastly, through our um, OPT analysis as well, we found some data irregularities where stunting was, was underestimated. So, so normally we would expect you know, when we graph uh, height for age z-scores, which is how we try to measure stunting, we would expect a normal distribution. And what we actually found were that there were clear discontinuities around the, the stunting cutoff, where it seems that um, stunting was underestimated in order to make the nutrition situation uh, seem a bit better in their localities. And this was actually driven primarily by LGUs that were MLP award winners. Those that had actually never won the MLP awards, uh, we don't really see any data irregularities, but those that, uh, that were winners, we, we see these irregularities. And we discussed this actually in detail with NNC and our partners and what the possibilities could be. And, and it seemed very likely that this could be actually a deliberate manipulation of the data. Um, and that said, at the moment, um, there, there weren't many um, accountability mechanisms or data quality checks to make sure that the, the OPT data um, was actually quality data. Next slide, please. So our recommendations in terms of data quality, um, we recommend implementing a, a data auditing system where you can have random or targeted audits to make sure that um, there's uh, quality data that's being collected and also giving more targeted training to those who are collecting the data. Um, and I should commend the NNC, they acted extremely quickly from our findings and have actually already started revising the guidelines for the OPT plus um, and are developing an auditing system already. Um, in terms of coverage, uh, with the electronic OPT system, we recommend that it's structured to really easily track all children, especially so if there are um, a number of, of households that may have been missed in a given year, at least frontline healthcare workers know which houses were missed. And then of course, in terms of equipment, 
we recommend providing user-friendly instruments to ensure and ensuring that those instruments are calibrated correctly so that uh, we're really getting accurate measures um, from these of these children. We also recommend that there's enough of these uh, of this equipment in, in each LGU. So as many reported that um, they really didn't have enough um, equipment, enough height boards, enough weighing scales, given the, the size, the scale of work that they needed to do. So we recommend to ensure at least one weighing scale and height board for, for every two frontline work, uh, workers uh, in an LGU. Next uh, slide, please. Our, our second recommendation is to sharpen messages around stunting. And I've included a um, quote here from a Barangay nutrition scholar. Um, so she, she told us that uh, children are stunted because it's in their blood. But when I attended a seminar where, uh, where they discussed stunting, I actually found out that it was due to lack of nutritious, nutritious food. Next slide, please. So her earlier perception is actually a perception we find that it's quite widespread, uh, particularly at lower levels. So at the municipal level, at the barangay level, particularly among community members, there's this perception that height is only determined by genetics and stunting is really not a medical concern, but it's really more related to aesthetics. And um, you know, a common uh, response is, you know, we're, we're Filipinos, we're just short. And I should say that this, this perception or this misconception is, is something that's really not just unique to the Philippines. A lot of countries are, are facing this challenge. Um, across for, for frontline healthcare workers, particularly barangay nutrition scholars, many of them could identify stunting as a, a problem, but they had some difficulty defining what stunting was and, and what its consequences were. Um, and, and especially notably, many uh, said that, you know, stunting could actually not be addressed by an intervention, which of course is, is not the case. So if there are these widespread, you know, misconceptions, then we would expect that chronic malnutrition such as stunting would be neglected. And, and that's what we find. Um, so typically among frontline healthcare workers, there's this clinical orientation where acute malnutrition is prioritized over chronic malnutrition. So BNS is really focused on underweight children and wasted children using a case management approach. So of course it's, it's important to, to also prioritize acute malnutrition, especially because wasted children, it, it's a very immediate nutrition concern, but it, it shouldn't be done to the exclusion of addressing issues of chronic malnutrition as well, which is was what we find generally. Uh, next slide, please. So with these issues, we, we recommend uh, improving messaging regarding stunting, following what we call the three S's. So the messaging should first be simple. So it should be something that is really easily understandable by anyone. Anyone could digest that information. The second, it should be salient. So it should really, the message should really resonate with people. And it's something that they should be able to recall over time quite easily. And lastly, it should be solvable. So um, it, the message should really convey, convey that uh, stunting is something that could be prevented, that it could be reversed um, through quite simple interventions. It's something that can be addressed. Next slide, please. So our third recommendation is to focus more effort at the barangay level, which is really the primary site of nutrition programming implementation. And here's a quote here from one barangay captain who, who told us, I actually don't know much about the PPAN. I was only informed about it when I received the coordination letter for this study. Next slide. So first we, we see that there's a disconnect between the, the higher and the lower levels. Um, and this is really a limitation of the cascading approach that's followed by the PPAN, where it, it starts at the national level and then cascades down to the barangay level. We find that cascading is, is a really slow process and usually understanding of the PPAN fades at lower levels. So at the national, region, national level, regional level, provincial level, we find a really strong understanding of the PPAN and an alignment with the PPAN among its nutrition action plans. But then once we get to the municipal and barangay levels, we see less alignment, uh, less understanding, and to a certain degree, um, just no awareness at all of, of the PPEN. 
And, and this in part has to do um, with the organizational structure at these lower levels. So um, they're really limited into the to the extent that uh, these structures rely on designated personnel who often lack capacity or accountability. So um, especially with nutrition action officers who are designated personnel. So uh, nutrition programming implementation is, is not their primary role. So um, many times it will be um, MHOs or agricultural officers, and, and those are really their primary responsibilities. And many times they, they don't actually have the time to dedicate um, to overseeing uh, implementation of, of the PPEN. Um, of course, where there are pl plantilla positions, they, they do have the time because these, um, these personnel have, um, you know, they're working full time on nutrition implementation, but we don't find that very common in our field sites. And um, also the barangays are relying on a, a cadre of volunteers where turnover can be high and accountability mechanisms are often lacking. So they often don't have very clear guidelines um, and clear kind of targets that they're, they're held to. So you can imagine that at these lower levels that are relying on staff that aren't working full time or who are just volunteers um, where we could uh, start seeing some some disconnects between um, um, how the the PPEN should be implemented. Next slide, please. We also find implementation implementation fidelity lacking. So we we looked at two programs related to chronic malnutrition. So one uh, was micronutrient supplementation. And we find for vitamin A supplementation, actually, that it's being implemented quite well. Uh, but when it comes to iron and micronutrient powder supplementation, we find that frontline healthcare workers are really giving half of the recommended amounts uh, based on the guidelines that are given. And then for infants and young child feeding programs, we find that the delivery really varies widely uh, by platform, by frequency, duration, and, and content. And, uh, Many times uh, BNS has had a hard time really defining what IYCF programs were, what they looked like. Um, they had difficulty really recalling any specific guidelines that they were given. And some examples of the variations we saw. So for example, mother's classes we find could be conducted between one and four times a year, uh, lasting from 30 minutes to, to three days. And in terms of community-based approaches, particularly those that could help um, target those children within the first 1,000 days of life, we find that these are largely absent. So one example of these would be breastfeeding support groups, which is recommended by the PPEN. Um, we actually didn't really see that in any of our field sites. And in these field sites, we also don't really see any systematic process evaluations of key programs to really assess implementation of uh, implementation fidelity. So these programs are being run, but many of those who are running it actually don't have an idea of how well they're being run, whether the inputs are, are translating to outputs. And, and implementation, sorry, process evaluations are, are really important tools to understand what are the challenges being faced and how we can improve our, the delivery of our programs. Next slide, please. So in terms of our, our recommendations, um, so as I mentioned, alignment of the PPEN fades at lower levels. And so we recommend that there's more direct trainings and efforts that are um, provided to the barangays, especially because these are the, the main sites of nutrition implementation. So it's really important that they, they know and understand the PPEN and the, uh, the strategies and programs that it recommends to to improve their LGU's nutrition status. Another um, recommendation that um, was often cited was uh, plantilla positions, that those that uh, LGU's that have plantilla, plantilla positions really have more capacity to, to tackle nutrition issues when they have um, you know, the right uh, personnel who have the time to, to work on it. Also, uh, with the lack of awareness of implementation fidelity of key programs, uh, which limit ability to learn and improve. Uh, we recommend that more 
process evaluations are conducted. And, and you don't have to do it of any program, but really you can prioritize those programs. So particularly those programs that are expected to have a high impact on stunting or those who really have a large budget, um, it can be really helpful to conduct process evaluations. And lastly, um, improving implementation fidelity and, and accountability is, um, is important. So really clearly communicating guidelines to lower levels and, and basing performance in part on delivery of those outputs. Next slide, please. And the last um, recommendation that I will be discussing is really just strengthening programs that address stunting. And I have a quote here uh, where Barangay Nutrition Scholar said, yes, we have a feeding program. And this almost always was the response to the question to what nutrition programs do you implement in your LGU? Um, more often than not, frontline healthcare workers equate in nutrition programs with feeding programs. Uh, next slide, please. And this isn't so much a surprise because these are the programs that really get the most budget uh, we found. Um, there's a really a lot of attention that, attention that is given to, to feeding programs, but even then we find that they tend to be kind of sporadic and, and low intensity. So many times they're diverging from, from the guidelines uh, that would make them effective. Um, another important thing about these feeding programs is often they're reaching children that are over the age of two. So they're missing a key population that we want to reach when addressing stunting, and that's children within the first 1,000 days. Um, as I mentioned earlier also, the focus of frontline workers is primarily on acute malnutrition over chronic malnutrition. So in that sense, they're also focusing more on these, these feeding programs. And for the incentives of, of LCEs, they tend to wanna to prioritize the most visible programs that will, will show that they're doing something for the community. So in general, our recommendations here, of course, it can be quite difficult um, because nutrition programming and implementation is, is decentralized, but um, one recommendation is try to kind of provide the right incentives to change the orientation um, of LGU so that they start addressing um, stunting more and, and implementing programs that would address stunting. So this can be through um, financial incentives or non-financial rewards um, to, to get them to change their behaviors. But uh, it, we should keep in mind that if we do give, in, um, give incentives, we should make sure that they're attractive and attainable to even the worst performing LGUs. Next slide, please. So to, to recap, uh, the four main recommendations from the study uh, are to strengthen the credibility of the OPT+, to sharpen messages around stunting, to, to change perceptions of um, what stunting is and how it can be addressed, to focus more efforts at the barangay level. Um, so this is where we see a disconnect um, and, and kind of disalignment with the PPEN, even though the barangay level is the, the main site of nutrition implementation. Not the only site, of course, but, but one of the main sites. Um, and also to strengthen programs that address stunting, that you know, don't, don't only just focus on feeding programs to the exclusion of other programs. So we should uh, beef up these programs that are proven to have a, a um, large impact on, on stunting. And, and I should say, um, you know, it's not all doom and gloom, of course. I'm, I'm really just focusing on the challenges that we found, because as I mentioned, um, to look at the way forward, we need to see what are the main bottlenecks, what are the main challenges um, that are being faced in nutrition program implementation and how we can improve. Um, so I'm really just focusing on the challenges that, that, we, that we found. Uh, next slide. So where do we go from here? So if you go, uh, if you remember that slide that I showed in the beginning, if you can go to the next slide, please. It showed the, the different components of program evaluation. And these different program evaluations can really help guide our policies going forward to make sure that we, we have a proven impact. And, and we can also um, use these evaluations as a learning tool. So many times when people think of evaluation, they think, you know, this is really a validation tool that, you know, it's either a thumbs up or thumbs down. And that's definitely not the way we really think about evaluation. Um, instead, it's a learning tool to understand 
how can we really improve our programs to really maximize our impact for the populations that we're trying to serve. So through, through this study and through other studies, we're already getting a sense of what are the problems uh, that are being faced um, in terms of improving the nutrition situation in the Philippines. Um, so now we wanna think of, okay, well, what are some programs, what are some interventions that could help address those problems? And that's what a program theory assessment would do. So how in theory do we conceptualize um, fixing this problem? And then a process evaluation, once you've designed the program, a process evaluation will help you determine, okay, are we actually implementing the program as planned? Are our inputs translating to outputs? And once we've really nailed down implementation, then we can conduct an impact evaluation. So if we already know that the program's being delivered, we wanna know, okay, well, are we actually achieving the impact? Are we achieving the, um, improving the nutritional situation of um, Filipinos? Were the goals achieved? And, and not only that, but what's the magnitude of the program? And then lastly, um, but also importantly, we also want to know the cost effectiveness. So we might see that there's an impact, but very especially, especially for, for poly, policymakers, it's important to know at what cost. And with cost effectiveness analysis, um, what's especially helpful is that you can compare the cost effectiveness of different programs that are designed to achieve the same outcome. So we can know which programs really give us the, more, uh, the most bang for our buck. Next slide, please. So hopefully through this study, it helps everyone give a sense of what are some possible areas to focus on um, going forward. So one would be imp improving and leveraging the OPT plus to, um, to improve the stunting situation in the country. The second would be to change perceptions of stunting and influence behavioral change. The third would be looking at innovative platforms for service delivery. Um, so one would be strengthening BNS or BHW services or testing different community-based approaches that seem to largely be lacking in our, our field sites. And the fourth would be strengthening LCE level governance and incentives um, so that they, they start prioritizing um, chronic malnutrition and stunting. So thank you very much for your time and attention and I will now pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you, Peter, for that uh, insightful presentation. Some of the findings that you've mentioned are... Wait. You okay? Okay. So some of the findings that you've mentioned are quite interesting and troubling, troubling actually. But um, I liked it that you've also included recommendations or options that uh, the government can take to address those issues. But um, I'm sure we'll have more discussion about this in the next part of our program. We've invited three, panel, um, three panelists, three experts to give their reactions, two from government and one from the private sector. First, we have Dr. Asusena Dayanghirang, who is, all, who is the Executive Director of the National Nutrition Council. And then we have Dr. Imelda Angeles Agdepa, Chief Science Research Specialist and Scientist too, and Officer in Charge of the Office of the Director of the Food and Nutrition Research Institute. And lastly, we have Dr. Crystal Haijing Huang, an economist from ID Insight, which is a global advisory data analytics and research organization. First to share her reaction is Dr. Dayang Hirang from the National Nutrition Council. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A pleasant morning to everyone. My courtesies to Senator Risa B. Honteberos, Chairperson, Committee on Women, Children, Family Relations, and Gender Equality. Also to Senator Amy R. Marcos, author of Senate Bill Number 1885, Establishing a Results-Based National Evaluation Policy, and Chairperson, Committee on Economic Affairs. 
also to Representative Alfred D. Vargas, principal author of House Bill Number no. 3293, establishing a national evaluation policy, 5th District of Quezon City House of Representatives, Mr. Peter Ruji, Senior Research Manager, Innovations for Poverty Action, and FNRI OIC Director, my co-panelist, Dr. Imelda Agdepa, also Dr. Crystal Wong of ID Insight, uh, NEDA Director Villeta S. Corpus, and Mr. Ronald R. Golding, Director General, Senate Economic Planning Office, and also Director Maria Cristina R. Pardalis of CEPO. Uh, Mr. Martin Porter of UNICEF Philippines and all the webinar participants present today. Again, pleasant morning. Allow me first to thank NEDA and the UNDP for supporting the PIPAN formative evaluation as a priority under the Strategic Monitoring and Evaluation or MLE project and from which the National Nutrition Council has extensively participated as one of the key members of the Evaluation Reference Group, or the ERG. Actually, we welcome this study as it provides ex external and impartial evaluation of how the PIPAN is being implemented as well as how stunting is being addressed by the national and local government units in the country. We also believe in the vital role of evidence-based evidence-assisted decision in recalibrating the PIPAN for a more responsive action for nutrition. And we hope to contribute to the achievement of the objectives of this webinar, that is to raise awareness, to optimize programs, and to impart the value of policy evaluation. Well, my presentation will follow this outline. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. My presentation will follow this outline. A brief mention of the successes of PIPAN implementation based on the study. Next is the main findings of the study and its recommendations to address these findings in National Nutrition Council's response and finally ending with NNC's call to action. Next slide. So let me first acknowledge the successes of PIPAN implementation based on the study. The study pointed out the success of the LGU mobilization or local government units mobilization as measured by the support to PIPAN programs at the national, regional, and provincial levels. A sustained nutrition action planning processes at the national level was also pointed out by the study NNC has been doing its best to cascade this to the municipal down to the barangay level. Next slide, please. And let me now move on to the main findings of the study, which can be summarized as follows. One is the widespread misconception on stunting, not only among the community members, but also among the barangay implementers, health and nutrition care workers, and the local chief executives. Second is there is a disconnect between higher level nutrition actors and barangay frontline implementers along appreciation of nutrition, the nutrition planning process, support and support to PIP and programs and to nutrition workers. And lastly, the data quality issues of Operation Timbang Plus as the primary monitoring and evaluation tool to track malnourished children at the barangay level. Next slide, please. Worthwhile to mention also are the recommendations of the study. These are sharpening and delivering salient messages on stunting, focusing efforts at the barangay level and strengthening the OPT system. But first, let me discuss briefly the concept of stunting. Is stunting actually it not, is not just a health and nutrition problem, but a whole of society concern. It is not just a measure of physical development, but of social and economic development as well. Stunting has consequences not only on health, but on social behavior, education, and productivity. 
Further, stunting is also a measure of the quality of governance as measured in, as mentioned in the study, determined by indicators such as bureaucratic effectiveness, political stability, restraint of corruption, and democratic accountability. Next slide, please. NNC is at this point will respond to the findings and recommendations as mentioned in the study. The first recommendation on sharpening and, the, and delivery of salient messages on stunting addresses the widespread misconception on stunting of community members, implementers, healthcare workers, and most especially our local chief executives. Next slide. One of the most widely known activity to deliver key nutrition messages is the celebration of our annual nutrition month. For 2020, it focused on stunting with the theme, Batang Pinoy, Sana Tol, Iwa Stunting, Sama All. While July is designated as Nutrition Month, actions to achieve the objectives of the celebration have been sustained throughout the year. However, even in 2017, NNC started its advocacy campaign to address stunting. Next slide, please. In fact, the 32 PIPAN focused provinces were selected mainly because of their high prevalence of stunting among under five children. These areas were also adopted as priorities of the Interagency Task Force on Zero Hunger and the Expanded Partnership Against Hunger and Poverty. Also, the NNC Governing Board and the NNC Secretariat task itself to improve access of people to quality nutrition specific and nutrition sensitive services as well as enabling programs through the management of the national nutrition program which is the PIPAN. This year as part of our COVID-19 response NNC will lead the implementation of the dietary supplementation program among pregnant women and six to 23 months old children as these population groups are the most, most vulnerable. Next slide, please. Further, changing behaviors with regard to stunting has, has gone beyond disseminating promotional materials with key messages on stunting but carried out using a combination of channels, including interpersonal communication at the community level through nutrition education classes. We also use community, our community radios where NNC has 50 Nutriscuela community radio stations nationwide, 30 of which have partnered with the Department of Education to air depth ed lessons. We also use mass media. And with COVID-19, NSC has embarked on an online dissemination with the first 1,000 Days PH digital project, a Facebook page that brings simple messages on how to address stunting by providing tips for a healthier first 1,000 days of a child. And with the NNC home or home online nutrition exchange, where one of the episodes focused on the strategies to prevent stunting, especially during this pandemic. Next slide, please. Recommendation number two on focusing technical support at the subnational level, specifically at the barangay level, hopes to bring or to bridge the disconnect in the planning process as it cascades from the national to the subnational level. This paper points out that as one goes down to the primary level, there is weak planning, there is fast turnover of human resources and limited awareness on nutrition. This paper actually also pointed out that at the primary level, the importance of nutrition and its human resources are considered as a token in local terms, saling pusa are not really part of the game. In these areas, there are no local nutrition committees, no nutrition action officers, or the nutrition action officers are not mandatory positions, and designation of volunteer workers are subject to the whims of the local chief executives. In contrast, there are also champion LGUs 
that put premium on nutrition through effective nutrition program management by having functional nutrition committees, full-time nows or nutrition action officers, full, and full support to the Barangay Nutrition Scholars with high proportion of approved budget for payment programs. To date, NNC has recognized 239 local government units for their exemplary management of the nutrition program. This disparity is what the LG mobilization under the PIPAN pillar on enabling program wants to bridge. Next slide, please. Prior slide, please. Previous, yes. In 2019 and before the pandemic, we have completed the local nutrition action planning workshops in the 32 HDPRC or Human Development Poverty Reduction Cluster Provinces to ensure that LGUs are oriented on PIPAN programs and to ensure that nutrition is integrated in their local development as well as in their investment and annual budgets. Initially, as a result of the local nutrition action planning workshop, 1.3 billion pesos in, 2000, in 2020 LGU budget for PIPAN programs has been approved. Presently, we are conducting various action planning workshops in non-PIPAN priority provinces using the online platform. Also, for the longest time, NNC conducts nutrition program management trainings for local chief executives in the context of local governance. NNC also actively participated in the newly elected officials or the new training through the Local Government Academy of the Department of Interior and Local Government. The conduct of nutrition program management training and local nutrition action planning workshop falls under the LG mobilization. Next slide, please. We continue to provide support to our barangay nutrition workers to effectively deliver nutrition services, which includes orientation on the use of various tools to generate data for identification of appropriate interventions. NNC continues to train and retrain barangay nutrition scholars despite fast turnovers in human resource for nutrition due to varying reasons. Next slide, please. Recommendation number three on strengthening the OPT system addresses the data quality issues to make OPT or Operation Timbang as a more effective planning and resource allocation tool, as well as to track performance of nutrition program. Next slide, please. This annual activity at the Barangay level has long been the source of data on selected nutrition indicators at the local level. Given the history of the system, we acknowledge the presence of data quality issues which are exhibited in low coverages and incomplete data. The system has been updated to conform with standards. The manual system of data collection, calculation, and reporting was then transformed into an Excel-based electronic system to somehow address these issues. However, these issues can be due to uncontrollable and controllable factors such as the area covered by the Barangay Nutrition Scholars, presence of armed conflict, which hinders actual conduct of Operation Timbang, the absence of proper height and weight measuring tools, or worse, having no Barangay Nutrition Scholar at all. NNC, on a year-to-year -year basis, was able to procure weight and height measuring tools from its annual allocation, but the funds are never enough to provide for all. Some LGUs with the capacity to procure for their DNSs are encouraged to do so. Next slide, please. We recognize that these issues need to be addressed and these cannot be done by merely computerizing the system. It requires a supportive environment.
We're going to have a health break first while waiting for Dr. Dayang Hirang's connection to return. Um, in the meantime, we would like to acknowledge the participation of um, our representatives, the legislative staff from the offices of Representative Gabriel Bordado Jr., Joy Myra Tambunting, Irene Gay Saulog, Ra Rosanna Vergara, and Wilter Palma II uh, in the Facebook page. And now we're back. Hello. Hi, we're back. Yes, we're happy so, that you're yeah. back. So, no, we're not here the office of internet connection, but we're back now. So, I think I skipped, uh, I, I ended with slide number, what slide are we? Seven, is it? 17, ma'am. Can we have slide number 17, please? One seven, slide number 17. Oh, yeah, okay, that's it. So I, sh I, can I continue now? All right. So we recognize that these issues need to be addressed and these cannot be done by merely computerizing the system. It requires a supportive environment. It needs investment to hire barangay nutrition scholars, build their capacities on proper measurement techniques by the appropriate and user-friendly measuring tools and the computers to use the electronic tool. And this takes us back to the issue of making nutrition an equally important program with funding complement. Next slide, please. At the start of my presentation, I mentioned that one of the objectives of this activity is to appreciate the value of policy evaluation, which we will use to recalibrate PIPAN programs. With regard to optimization, the National Nutrition Council would like to recommend the following as a result of the evaluation, particularly along legislative measures. We are proposing the amendment of PD-491 or the Nutrition Act of the Philippines creating my office, the National Nutrition Council, and Executive Order Number 234 on the reorganization of NNC to strengthen the National Nutrition Council structure and function uh, and making the local nutrition committees functional. Second, the amendment of presidential decree 1569 or the Barangay Nutrition Program Law to strengthen the Barangay Nutrition Scholars by requiring LGUs to support the Barangay Nutrition Scholars and their functions inherent to the role they play in the community. Unless there are such actions, it will be very difficult to scale up nutrition. Third is the strict implementation of RA11148 or otherwise known as the Kalusugan na Nutrition Magnanay Act or ECCD law with the Department of Health as the lead and DA and DSWD as an NSC as colleagues to contribute to the reduction of stunting and wasting. Next slide. In, in closing, the formative evaluation leads to three points of action, which we all want all nutrition stakeholders all over the country to act on. One, Filipinos need to realize that we are not short because it is our lahi or because of genetics. We can become taller with better nutrition. Second, raising awareness on stunting as it's not just a health and nutrition issue, but also an economic 
as well as major impediment to human development. We need to push for increased investments for nutrition from the national government down to the local government units. And lastly, a whole of government approach is needed because malnutrition extends beyond the health and nutrition sector. It is in agriculture, gender and development, education, and local government. It also requires the engagement of multiple stakeholders through the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, the Interagency Task Force on Zero Hunger, and the Expanded Program Against Hunger and Poverty. Last slide. As we say at the National Nutrition Council, Sapipan, Panalo Ang Bayan. Maraming salamat. Pleasant morning to everyone. May God bless us all. Thank you, Dr. Dayang Hirang. Next to give her reaction is Dr. Imelda Agdepa from the Food and Nutrition Research Institute. Yes, and good morning. Um, may I be allowed to actually share my screen? Yes, you may, Dr. Can you see now my screen? Okay, so a pleasant morning to everyone, uh, to our distinguished policymakers from the Senate and uh, from the House of Representatives, and uh, of course to our Senator Risa Honteveros, our Senator uh, Honorable uh, Amy Marcos, and Honorable Representative Alf Alfred Vargas, and from the other non-government agencies and international agencies, uh, and to all our partners, uh, Dr. Dayang Hirang, who had just uh, had the presentation on, uh, on the PIPAN, uh, pleasant morning to all. So uh, allow me to actually uh, present to you uh, in this order. So first, I'd like to present uh, DOST as a research agency and the reactions to the evaluation of the PIPAN as well as a DOST technologies as possible solutions. So um, this is the institute. Uh, it is actually in uh, the at Bikutan Tagig and it is the premier research and development institute of the government in terms of food and nutrition and other science and technology services. We are mandated to define uh, the nutritional status of our population and uh, from the different uh, malnutrition problems as actually evidenced by the National Nutrition Survey, we develop and recommend policy options, strategies, programs, and projects. And after developing these strategies or policies or uh, these uh, technologies, we diffuse the knowledge and the technologies to the stakeholders. So in uh, 2019, uh, we actually had conducted the second round of the rolling survey. And we have uh, actually uh, covered about uh, 49,042 uh, households and about 165,586 uh, individuals, covering actually the different components of the National Nutrition Survey that's actually from uh, anthropometry, biochemical, clinical, dietary, socioeconomic, infant and young child feeding, maternal and child health, and other government programs. And uh, allow me now to, uh, to actually just project to you what has been presented uh, by Peter and uh, Dr. Dayang Hirang. You can see that uh, for the past uh, 16 years, from 2003 to 2019, stunting is really not uh, declining so much. No, It did not give us a very significant decline. And if you compare uh, actually the 2003 to 2019, we just had about five percentage point decline in the prevalence of stunting. And so with the other uh, undernutrition problems. And uh, with the micronutrient deficiencies, um, our vitamin A has declined, uh, although, but uh, we still are having about mild to moderate problem of vitamin A deficiency. And the same holds true with anemia. 
So with that in context, uh, allow, uh, we can say that uh, the conse consequences of child malnutrition affects health, productivity, and economic growth, which was actually well explained by our two previous presenters. So with regards to our DUST FNI reaction and recommendations, uh, it seems that we have similarities with the previous um, presentations. So uh, with regards to the disconnect between the PFANC strategic thrusts and planning and the LGU prioritization and implementation, we are actually inclined to really do some sort of involving the local level implementers, like for example, the city and municipal barangay nutrition committees in the planning process. Uh, this will allow them to uh, identify their local problems and do some sort of um, base, uh, as basis to solve their problems and put solutions onto it. Uh, with bottom-up planning, we cannot go wrong, actually. And um, we also like to empower. Uh, local empowerment is the key, and therefore we have to strength, strengthen the quality and simplicity of messages imparted during advocacy activities aiming for actions. So if we try to advocate, we really aim to have actions because um, advocating without any response is really very ineffective uh, messaging. No? So we better highlight the different laws and the national feeding law also. So we have to strengthen local intersectoral linkages. Uh, what we are doing here, the zero hunger programs, activities and projects at the national level must be mirrored at the local government units. Um, our our CABSEC has actually formed this uh, Zero Hunger Task Force involved, involving the different uh, government uh, offices like the Department of Interior and Local Government, uh, the NEDA, the uh, DTI, and uh, the DA, and all other nutrition-related agencies are actually involved in the task force, and therefore what is being discussed at the national level must be mirrored down the line. So member agencies must be must issue directives to prioritize the allocation of local funds for the different nutrition pops in action plans, as is stipulated in the DILG um, uh, memorandum circular in 2018. And uh, there is a need to uh, for the second uh, uh, findings that is uh, there was a weak nutrition program leadership. Local chief executives lack knowledge and insight on the prob uh, on the nutrition problem. They preferred tangible programs. So there is a need to review the context of messages imparted. No, as has been said a while ago, simplicity and I, I think uh, there's a need to have a heart piercing messages might help. No, <laughs> equating the cost of malnutrition to economic losses and children's school performance and livelihood infrastructure and agriculture products are very important as nutrition sensitive projects and, um, and uh, beneficiaries must be the marginalized sectors or families of the local government unit. So these are very important if they have the agricultural projects and, and the livelihood projects for as long as the target population are the beneficiaries of the marginalized sectors, this will also help. And um, Another one is to uh, make representations to the local government units like the leagues and organizations no? uh, and uh, try to actually convince them to really put forward some uh, funds for nutrition programs. Select a popular personality as advocate of nutrition. This is actually done by our CABSEC uh, Nograles already. And uh, for the, for the um, Recommendation or the finding number three, basic nutrition services were hints on volunteers, designated staff, and so on, and project-based staff. I think um, the NNC, uh, our, our executive director, Diane Hira, has already posted this challenge to authorities, and currently there are nutritionists already in priority areas, and the effort will be continued as funds would be available. So incentivize the BNS, I think, uh, there's a need for us to really um, uh, have uh, all, uh, all municipal nutrition action officers must be actually hired already by all municipalities because uh, since malnutrition is a problem, nobody is a caretaker down the line. We, this has been a persistent problem throughout, no? but then if you see down the line, there is no caretaker for nutrition programs. 
uh, if you think of the national of the physicians, the nurses, and the midwives that at the municipal level, the these uh, manpower or health manpower have really workloads, pile of workloads to be to carry out, and therefore they cannot uh, focus much on the different nutrition problems in the community. So the issue on OPT data quality and misconceptions and causes. So OPT data quality. So we have to provide, sabi nga ni uh, Dr. Diane Hirang, it is actually an investment. So we have to provide the uh, appropriate, easy to operate and adequate uh, calibrated tools and equipment. So it should be the digital and lightweight so that our barangay nutrition sco uh, scholars and barangay health workers can just carry uh, in a, uh, an assembly type uh, gathering. No? And regular monitoring and mentoring by the MNOW on correct data collection and uh, recording. So based on the policy statement of OPT, uh, we already have developed policy statements. This has been already forwarded also to, to, to NNC and uh, actually to the Congress and Senate uh, because one of the functions of FNRI is to develop policy statement based on our malnutrition problems. So we have to institutionalize the conduct of continuous training, orientation, and reorientation of community health workers on measurements and uh, recording of data. We visit the OPT process and develop an efficient delivery system, including validation of measurements and records. And the misconception on causes and implications of stunting, of course, um, messaging must be reviewed and the advocacy to the local government uh, units uh, as has been presented in my previous slides. Based on our results on stunting, the, persis uh, the persistent drivers of stunting are also solvable that is actually poor environment where the child receives poor care with poor sanitation and unsafe water supply and, family, uh, and uh, bigger family size. So these are really uh, within our control for as long as there is good messaging and there is actually a lot of commitment among our health workers and our doers. So with regards to the issues on leadership, human resources, monitoring and evaluation, this issue might have been encountered because roles as uh, MNOWs are just in addition to the regular functions of hard staff. No? So that means, uh, that means to say the, they might be overloaded and therefore there is really a need to hire a uh, specific municipal action officer in the locality. For every health and nutrition activities, projects and programs to be conducted, always identify key and responsible persons to lead and adequate number of staff to work on the task. As the program starts in planning, let it end with monitoring and evaluation for it always goes back to the objectives, what has been accomplished and what is still to be done to complete the tasks. And of course, um, if we really want to solve the problem of stunting, we have to focus on the root causes of stunting and other nutrition problems. Strong political will, that nutrition is the best country's investment and uh, there should be more evidence-based policies on impact of nutrition intervention mix or models. Now, um, as I have said, based on our studies, uh, when we took into, uh, when we took uh, a, when we undertook a study on uh, our data in uh, 2003 and until 2011, those meaning, uh, those who were actually covered in the 2003 survey and also was were there during the 2011 survey. And we analyzed the, uh, the factors of persistently stunted. So what are the drivers of stunting that is actually persistently existing? And uh, we have found that uh, having a birth interval of fewer than two years increases the odds of being persistently stunted by 4.3 compared to those households with only one child. And households with two or more children below five years old might explain a child remaining stunted through middle childhood. And another, um, uh, another factor is the presence of electricity and usage of water sealed toilets in the household decreases the odds of persistently stunting so that means to say those who are living actually in Barong Barong has a higher 
ads to become stunted children. And um, of course, uh, if we like to see also the root cause uh, or the, the focus of, if we try to focus our, our interventions, focus on the uh, food insecure households, which are actually dominating in among households, uh, Filipino households. And you can see the graph here. There are a lot of moderately food insecure and severely insecure, mostly among those living in the rural area. And if you can see, these are among the poorest sectors of the population. And um, allow me now to just uh, um, show to you all the different um, technologies of FNRI that could offer possible solutions to the problems. And these are the different uh, uh, food products of FNRI. So you can see there the different uh, rice mongo products, our um, sachets, um, what they call this, um, the multi-nutrient uh, multi growth mix uh, with 15 micronutrients. Uh, it's just like a sugar with, uh, in a sachet wherein they can only just uh, actually mix it or sprinkle it uh, in any uh, infant's uh, meal or uh, infant's food. And uh, you can also see all those uh, pack, uh, these um, nutty fruity bar and other uh, uh, products of FNRI. And uh, the Nutriban is our latest technology, which is actually used by DepEd and DSWD. This was actually been popularized during the Marcos regime, and now it is promoted by our Cabsec Navales. And these are the other products of FNRI that are actually uh, nutrient dense. And uh, we also developed uh, other technologies like the my plate in uh, the version of the my plate, which we call this here in the Philippines as Pingang Pinoy. And uh, all the technologies we are actually currently in, uh, in 34 functional complementary food products and facilities all over the Philippines. And uh, that ends my presentation. Maraming salamat and thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Agdepa. So now we are going to hear from Dr. Crystal Huang from ID Insight. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Peter, for an insightful presentation and to your team for the very well executed report. I also like to thank other reactors, Dr. Dayang Hirang and Dr. Agdepa for your thoughtful points. And of course, to the distinguished members of Congress and other department officials for being here today. Um, last but not least, I'd like to thank the Senate Economic Planning Office for my invitation to present my reactions. It's really an honor to be here. I'm Crystal Huang. I'm an economist at ID Insight, and today I'll share my reactions to IPA's PPAN formative evaluation. And I'd like to really focus on this theme of generating evidence in the nutrition sector. Next. Before I begin, I just want to give a very brief overview for those in the audience who are not familiar with ID Insight. In a nutshell, we are a research and data analytics NGO that helps policymakers make evidence informed decisions. So we're distinguished by combining academic rigor with a responsiveness to client needs. So this means that we're really involved in various points of policymaking that a government might face from helping innovate and develop new ideas to testing, evaluating, iterating, and learning about which things actually work to then improving by taking action based on what the evidence says. Uh, our work spans three continents and seven offices and our Southeast Asia office um, is based in Manila. In the Philippines, we have worked very closely with a number of government agencies, including DOH, DTI, DOTR, DEPED, DA, and we've also been close partners with NEDA and the UNICEF Washington Health Team. Next, please. The way that we aim to achieve social impact is through um, data and evidence, and it's defined by three key pillars. So first is, um, rigor. So we want to generate accurate and precise evidence using the most rigorous techniques, for instance, randomized controlled trials. And secondly, we want to be able to deliver that evidence in time so that our partners can change things that are not working in real time, rather than finding out too late that their resources could have been better spent. And thirdly, our approach is demand driven. So the tools that we use 
evaluation tools and monitoring tools are meant to inform specific decisions. And these are tailored to um, our partners' context, needs, and budget. Next. So for my reaction presentation, I really want to focus on this question that Peter left with at the end of his presentation. So where do we go from here? How can we use evaluation as a forward-looking tool to improve the implementation and the effectiveness of programs? Next. This question, oh, you know, can I share my screen? I don't know why the formatting is really weird here. Is it okay if I share my screen? Okay. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, sorry, give me one second. Okay, you can see my presentation screen. Yes, but could you put it in slideshow, Dr. Crystal? Sorry, I don't know. It should be in slideshow. Um, give me one second. Hold on, just let me figure this out. <laughs> sure. Okay, so can you see it now as a slideshow? Not yet, but that would do, I guess. <laughs> Is this, what about now? All right. Yeah, it's on slideshow now. So it's, okay. it's on slideshow. Okay, so I'm gonna click through. You can see it on slideshow now. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, okay, so I just wanted to go back to this idea that, um, sorry, I'm gonna go back a slide. Okay, so this question of where do we go next brings us back to a point that Peter made earlier, that evaluation tools can be used to inform policy decisions throughout the program life cycle, from the early stage in terms of diagnosis and design to the scale-up stage. So this starts from doing a needs assessment, and this is exactly what IPA did. They did a very thorough and well-researched formative evaluation which is the first step that really lays the groundwork for doing further evaluation. And they basically describe the current status of different nutrition programs that were guided by PPAN. And they identified key priority areas where more efforts should be focused. So the question is, what's next? Um, and this brings us to a bunch of other tools that Peter highlighted earlier, ranging from process evaluations to impact evaluations that can be used to generate evidence at different points in the program life cycle. Of course, the nutrition policy in the Philippines encompasses a wide range of programs. Um, so the key, the, you know, the evaluation needs for each of these can vary, but the key point is that it's important to think ahead on what evidence needs are necessary to drive policy and make sure to proactively build data systems and collection activities to address those needs. So today I'll touch on a few of these um, other tools in my examples. To guide my discussion, I wanna focus on two key themes that are related to data and evidence gaps that was identified in the report. The first is around the lack of evidence on in the implementation and effectiveness of specific programs. So the PPAN consists of a menu of programs targeting different outcomes, you know, the first thousand days of life, micronutrient supplementation, et cetera. However, the report flagged certain challenges with some of these programs, including the demand and supply bottlenecks with iron and micronutrient powder supplementation, as well as infant and young child feeding programs. These call for um, process evaluations 
that really can track implementation progress. In combination, impact evaluations can also be used to assess the effectiveness of um, specific initiatives. And the second theme is related to data quality issues that are related to measurement. Um, this, is, this refers to issues more broadly with creating m &E systems to track nutrition and program specific indicators, as well as um, the issues with the OTP plus data set in particular, which really calls for strengthening monitoring and data systems and data reporting. Okay, so I'll focus on each of these in turn. So I wanna go back to um, two findings um, for the first point. The PPAN report found that one, there was generally a lack of awareness of stunting as a nutritional problem. And two, there were also challenges in promoting um, infant and young child feeding behaviors related to complementary and exclusive and on-time breastfeeding, as well as dietary diversity. And this was due to inadequate training materials, limited awareness of IYCF at barangay levels, and also women were not engaging with these messages at frequent touch points. And so there's just this general sense that there's lack of knowledge and awareness around certain key nutrition behaviors that should be practiced. Um, and so I wanna share this case study of how ID Insight helped the Indian government generate evidence to support a large scale nutrition program using social and behavior change communication messaging. And this was specifically targeting similar knowledge and behavior gaps. What is social behavior change messaging? So this is really the use of various communication tools and platforms to change behavior by influencing knowledge, attitudes, and norms around that behavior. And so why would we use SVCC? This is useful for several reasons. The first is that we know that alleviating supply side factors alone is not enough to change behavior. For instance, um, providing access or infra infrastructure may not lead to um, demand side changes. So vast literature has shown that even when people have access to healthcare or medications, for instance, supply of IFA tablets, they're still not taking it regularly or on time. The second is that behavior change and beliefs don't occur in a vacuum. They're grounded in practices, habits, or customs that are really deeply entrenched and can be quite widespread and pervasive, um, as we found um, that Peter mentioned earlier was the case with misconceptions and uh, misunderstanding around the issue of stunting as a nutritional problem. And thirdly, changing attitudes requires reinforcing the message from multiple sources. So it's not enough just to hear once from your nurse about complementary or diet feeding or dietary diversity. You really have to be hearing it from multiple sources um, in your society for that message to stick and for there to be these social norms around that behavior. So in India, SBCC was used as a core strategy that was part of a broader national nutrition mission called Poshan Abhiyan to improve nutrition across the country. Um, this initiative is about spreading behavior change and communication messages related to maternal, infant, and young child care and feeding practices. Um, it also targeted other messages related to growth monitoring, anemia, um, hygiene and sanitation, and such. And the target population was really um, the, you know, children in their first 1000 days of life. So pregnant women and mothers with children zero to 24 months old, which we know is a really critical time to be practicing these behaviors that can improve nutritional status later on. It disseminates a series of messages through 21 platforms. So ranging from interpersonal communications through frontline health workers, community-based events, as well as mass media approaches like TV and radio and mid media like newspapers, um, print media and wall posters. I thought that this was a really relevant example to highlight since I know that Nutrition Month also occurs in the Philippines. Um, and earlier, Dr. Um, the first reactant had mentioned that there were key, uh, this was also, you know, using mass media was also a way to really raise awareness. So I'd be curious to hear more about um, the, uh, the use of these approaches in the Philippines and how they compare. Here's just a quick visual of the simplified theory of change. Um, so first, the idea is that women must be exposed to the platforms that are generating the messages. 
And then they have to recall that they heard a nutrition message from that platform, which then should lead to increased knowledge retention. And then they should be able to correctly articulate what that behavior is. And hearing messages from multiple sources should also enhance their sense of self-efficacy or confidence around performing that behavior despite potential barriers. And lastly, they should be practicing the key behavior. So this is a simplified theory of change that really guided us with um, how we would structure our data collection activities. So what did we do? We conducted a process evaluation to track key SBCC indicators along this theory of change across 27 districts and five states in India. We did this to address an evidence and data gap. So we wanted to supplement the data the ministry was collecting. So they have some monitoring data, but you know, A, it's not clear how they were collected and B, they really only focused on attendance at key events. So we were really lacking ground data on these other critical process indicators in the theory of change. What kinds of platforms are reaching the most women? What kinds of messages do they recall hearing? What are knowledge levels and practice levels um, related to these behaviors? So collecting process indicators is really critical to identify bottlenecks and priority areas to improve implementation. We did this by conducting three large scale surveys um, across uh, India in three rounds. And we timed these to occur a couple of months after these major SBC um, communications pushes occurred. Uh, so we assessed current levels and the change in indicators using a really rich survey data um, from a representative sample of the target population. So pregnant women and mothers uh, with, of children zero to 24 months. And further, we were able to collect the data in both a rapid, a fairly relatively rapid and rigorous way using ID Insights data on demand infrastructure. So this infrastructure is basically comprised of enumerators that are embedded in their local communities who reside in the districts where we collected the data and who are trained data collectors. So they're able to go out and collect this data with minimal additional um, effort and, and get that to us within a short period of time. So we shared these learnings with the Ministry of Child and Women Development, who's responsible for running the National Nutrition Mission. And we framed the key findings in terms of right platforms, right messages, right quality, and right targeting. First, we found that by and large, the interpersonal communication and community engagement platforms were the most um, effective at reaching the most women. So most women recall, um, were um, seen by a frontline health worker or they either through a home visit or through a village health and nutrition day or through one of these community-based events where they heard one of these messages. Um, and this was much higher than digital and mid media. And this was also the platform that reached the poorer women um, who may not have access to the different kind of technological devices that are required to receive a message through digital media. Second, our data pointed to certain knowledge areas that were already quite high. So specifically early and exclusive breastfeeding, but importantly pointed out other areas that um, lagged behind. So knowledge was quite low related to complementary feeding and child di dietary diversity. And so we recommended that the government prioritize those messages. We also found that women were informed by frontline health workers about the behaviors they should be practicing, but few were able to recall the benefits of those behaviors or were shown how to exactly practice them. So in terms of the quality of messaging, we recommended greater emphasis on the how and why for these behaviors to really ensure that they have the self-efficacy to be practicing them. And lastly, targeting messages is really important. So we found that poor and less educated women generally have less exposure to most platforms, um, which really highlights the importance of hearing them from the frontline health workers and using interpersonal counseling for this group. 
When we collect data, we don't want it to just be, you know, a paper exercise or a validation exercise, as Peter said earlier, we want it to really drive learning. So we want it to be used and for it to drive action. In the case of our work with the Indian government, our evidence was used to help them determine how to allocate resources more effectively. Specifically, they de-invested in the really low performing platforms in terms of platform reach and in invested more in making interpersonal home visits and community-based events the highest frequency platforms. Um, and we did this through a combination of factors. So, you know, one, it's important to time the evidence to produce findings before key decisions are made, not after. And the second is through active collaboration with key players in the field by consulting um, key development partners, including Alive and Thrive, IFPRI, World Bank, we designed a really compelling survey to get it off the ground. And lastly, to um, focus on the rigor and leanness of data collection, um, really gathering the data that's really needed to fill evidence gaps. Um, what we did earlier was a process evaluation, you know, that can help assess implementation processes and outputs, but won't generate causal estimates of the impact of the program. I won't go through this in detail, but I wanted to just highlight two key behavior change programs that used a randomized control trial approach to assess impact. You know, one, the Alive and Thrive program, which some of you may have heard, is a pretty comprehensive package of interventions. And the second one is a more light touch um, SMS texting program that was used in Ecuador. In the last few minutes or so, I just want to leave you with some high level thoughts on how to strengthen data systems and data reporting on nutrition. And this is addressing the PPAN evaluation findings that there are gaps in the data system at large. So ME systems tracking nutrition doesn't exist. Um, and also some gaps in specific data sets like the OTP plus data set. A useful framework to think about creating a data pipeline for nutrition policy is to go back to the 2017 Global Nutrition Report, which introduces the idea of the nutrition data value chain. Um, so the idea behind this is to follow several steps. So first, um, create a systematic framework around the interventions and determinants and create a list of key indicators based on the different programs theory of change and maybe as they relate to the sustainable development goals. And as I mentioned earlier, these shouldn't just necessarily focus on outcomes like stunting, but also process indicators like the supply of micronutrients, knowledge of how to take them, um, adherence to them. And the second is to assess data availability across different data sources and see which data sets are really able to answer and collect data on these indicators that you identified, whether it's from the OTP or from the ENS, ENNS data. Uh, and lastly, determine gaps in data quality um, to or the availability and figure out how we're going to uh, solution strategies on how to collect it. Um, lastly, I just want to talk through a couple of ideas on how to really meet the objectives on improving the um, data value chain. So the first objective of optimizing the use of existing data can be improved by using digital tools, um, mobile apps to improve reporting and quality, as well as introducing um, some of the data quality systems that um, Peter talked about earlier. And second, to fill data gaps and enhance linkages requires collecting data on intermediate outputs and not just outcomes, as well as creating analytical outputs that combine data and visualize data from different sources. And thirdly, to strengthen the culture of data use requires um, really creating some follow-up actions and planning on um, what will be done when um, data is received and not just seeing, just not seeing it and waving it aside. Uh, and then also it would be interesting to develop and test incentives and accountability measures for using data to, um, to improve the quality of data as well as using it for decision making. Um, finally, I just want to circle back again to this message that evaluation tools can and should be used to inform decisions throughout the program lifecycle. And the evaluation activities and plans should be built in earlier on in the program planning stages and not just at the end, not just as a validation exercise, but really as a learning exercise. And that way the evidence produced is not just a paper exercise, but can be really useful and actionable for policy. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Crystal Wang. Your suggestions are well noted. Um, by the way, Dr. Wang has asked to be excused as she has an emergency family matter to attend to. So please, if you have any questions for her, kindly put it in the Q&A and we will just send them to her so she can reply. Thank you again, Dr. Wang, for being with us. Keep safe. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so um, at this point, we're going to ask Mr. Suji to give a quick reaction to what the reactor said. Peter? Okay, first I'd like to uh, thank very much uh, Dr. Dan Hirang from the NNC, uh, Dr. Angeles Agdepa from FNRI, and Dr. Huang from, from ID Insight. Um, I found all of your presentations to be uh, very insightful and informative. Um, and, and what I find really striking is um, there's actually a lot of alignment and, and agreement with um, the findings and, and recommendations from the study. I know we've worked quite closely um, with, with our partners, um, including the NNC. And, and I know many of the findings weren't necessarily surprising and they've been discussing how to address these challenges for a while. And it's um, very encouraging um, to be working with these, these partners um, who are very actively engaged and, and reacting to the findings um, really as quickly as possible. Um, I, um, there's, there's a few things that um, were mentioned that, you know, programs that are already being implemented to try to address these issues. Um, and I'd like to reiterate what uh, Dr. Huang was saying in terms of um, thinking evaluations as a forward-looking tool that we need to actually think about before we implement a program. So many times we think of evaluations as something you've done afterwards, right? So you've implemented the program, then you ask, okay, so how did we do? And now let's do an evaluation. Um, I'd like to actually um, challenge that and, and say, reiterate what Crystal, um, Dr. Huang was saying, um, that we should really think about evaluations at the very beginning before we actually roll out um, the intervention or the program and consider evaluations as something that we embed into our interventions. In that way, we can actually have more insightful and informative evaluations. Um, and, and as Crystal was mentioning, um, you can use um, the, you can follow the, the nutrition data value chain to really prioritize um, you know, what you should evaluate. You, know, you don't, might necessarily not need to evaluate everything, but you should prioritize um, you know, certain programs to evaluate and decide what kind of evaluation you need. So uh, for example, in developing an evaluation strategy, we wanna ask ourselves, what are some really important programs that we need to evaluate? So certain programs where let's say, uh, we don't have enough evidence of whether they work or not, um, and, and we wanna learn more, or they're programs that really require a lot of a funding, um, a lot of investments. I know um, Dr. Uh, Diane Hirang and, and Dr. Angeles Akdepa were saying, you know, we, we have potential solutions, but these also require investments. And we also, we wanna make sure that when we make investments that we're actually achieving the, the outputs and the outcomes that we, we intend to achieve. Um, and so building evaluations into that can help us better understand that. Uh, and when, I should also emphasize that when we conduct evaluations, um, I know I mentioned this before and Dr. Huang also mentioned this, but I'd like to also reiterate again that you know, val evaluations are not just a validation exercise. It's not simply accountability tool in the sense that it's saying whether you're doing the work or you're not doing the work. Um, it, it's actually quite uh, the contrary. It's, it's used as a, a learning tool where we wanna understand, okay, are we achieving our goals or not? To what magnitude? And if we're not achieving our goals, why? And that why is really key. Once we can understand the why, then it really provides a path into how to, how to improve. Um, and in working really closely with our partners, um, what I found striking was that they found that actually quite empowering. So we have done some evaluations where the findings maybe weren't as, um, they weren't very desirable, let's say. 
Um, but instead of it being a bit, uh, let's say, demotivating for the partner, it was actually quite the opposite. They found it empowering because now they could understand, okay, not only is our program not working exactly as we intended, but now we know why, and now we know where we can improve. And so as uh, we think about you know, a national evaluation framework, um, and mo improving monitoring and evaluation and building in our systems, I think that's a great way to think of it. Um, first, that it's a forward-looking tool that we should consider before we even roll out our evaluation. So as we design the program, already start thinking about evaluation and then thinking it as a learning tool. So um, how can we, we learn from um, our evaluations to improve our programs. And really it's an iterative process, right? You don't just do one evaluation and then you're set. Um, it answers a set of questions and uh, it informs your program. And then likely you'll have a, a set of other questions that you wanna ask. So um, you'll, it's, it's really an iterative, pro iterative process where evaluations should really be built um, into our programs. Um, as much as possible. But again, going back to, we really wanna prioritize. So of course our, our resources are limited. We can't do rigorous evaluations of everything necessarily. So we need to prioritize um, which programs are in need of evaluation and what are our data needs and, and how we can go about that. And I think Dr. Huang's presentation was uh, particularly insightful in terms of, of how to approach this. Um, one last thing I'd like to say is that um, as I mentioned, we've done over 900 evaluations across the world, and we've done a lot of evaluations in public health, and so has ID Insight, and, and a lot of other research organizations, um, including FNRI. And um, so when we, when we look into designing a program, we don't necessarily have to start from scratch, right? We can look at lessons learned from, from other countries. We can look at evaluations and think about uh, critically, how could this apply to the Filipino context? Um, so we don't always have to start from scratch. We can we can borrow from evidence from from other countries, and if we think maybe that you know it it doesn't necessarily translate to the Philippines, then then evaluate it here. We can try to adapt it to the Filipino context, and then evaluate to see if it achieves um, the same kind of outcomes that we um, intend to have. Thank you, Peter. The next part of the program actually reaffirms what you just said about the need to embed evaluation in all stages of government plans and programs. Um, we would now be linking this evaluation study to the practice and value of monitoring and evaluation to government and society. And for that, we have done other than Senator Amy Marcos, whose length and breadth of experience and immersion in grassroots concerns, starting from her days as the leader of the Kabataang Barangay, as Congressman Woman of Ilocos Norte, Governor of the Province Ilocos of Governor of the Province of Ilocos for nine years, and now Chair of the three Senate committees, the Committee on, on Economic Affairs, Electoral Reforms and Political Participation, and Cultural Communities provide valuable insights and influence in our concerted efforts to push for evidence-based policy making through the evaluation of government plans and programs. Senator Aimi is the author of Senate Bill number 1885, which aims to establish a results-based national evaluation policy. Let us give her a warm virtual round of applause. Ang katapat ay hasya, hasya ay may solusyon. Ang lugar ng problema ay bigyan ng solusyon. Huma hashtag, huma hashtag ay may solusyon. Good morning to everyone. First, may I greet the honorables, Senator Risa Antiveros, my constant ally in uh, many efforts for good governance as well as social development far beyond the brutish world of politics. Also, Representative Alfred Vargas, Kailian from the North, 
and Shorley, a distinguished sponsor in the lower house of the same national evaluation endeavor. Our guests and experts this morning, may I greet Dr. Azucena Dayanghirang, Dr. Imelda Angeles Agdepa, surely those are familiar names, and I suspect you may be married to someone from my hometown, Batak Ilocos Norte, Dr. Crystal Haijing Huang, our economist on board, and of course, our very own Ron Golding of CEPL here at the Senate. It's a joy and privilege to once again introduce this act, establishing a results-based national evaluation policy which uh, seeks to capacitate with the whole of government approach, multi-year projects and programs undertaken by government, often huge in scale, utilizing funds from myriad sources, such as the national budget, domestic and foreign loans, grants, donations, any which where financing can be found. And these are time bound indeed measurable, and they follow a life cycle where activities undertaken should lead to desired objectives and clear-cut results within that lifespan. However, as we know sadly, here in the Philippines, the flagship Build, Build, Build project has encountered all manner of struggle, delay, and confusion over the past few years. Certainly, it has been a great disappointment and uh, difficulty for many of us to understand why it should be so. What is clear from this experience is that much needs to be improved within the government project cycle, which has been more marred by extensions, cost overruns, outputs and outcomes that have nothing in common with the desired objectives. Truly, this disappointment could have been avoided had there been regular monitoring and above all, critical analytical evaluation of what had occurred during the lifespan of the said project by monitoring progress at every stage, identifying problems encountered, and ensuring that the project is really and truly on track. However, this has not been undertaken with any seriety or dedication. This well-meant endeavors though funded indeed and prioritized, have not managed to ensure intended results within a timely basis, also within the costs allocated. While the other versions of the bill refer to the OECD DAC guidelines, my bill explicitly indicates from the title that a results-based national evaluation policy and system must be in place. After all, this is the international standard for MNE, and we might as well adopt it. They are deeply interlinked with the results-based management principles that we wish to uphold in the national evaluation policy. As stated in the title, my bill seeks to establish an explicitly results-based national evaluation policy, thereby institutionalizing and legalizing what should be interlinked with the global standard of the OECD and DAC. This is important so that we have fully integrated and updated m and systems. Further, if you will notice, the bill that I have um, is aimed to apply to all branches of government, not merely the executive, as was previously stated, but including the legislative as well as the judiciary. In fact, I also, as a former governor, would like the same system of results-based management to be imposed on projects at the LGU or local government level. Many of the local governments are more than ready to implement such a monitoring and evaluation system. And certainly many of them have embarked on huge projects over many, many years 
that are urgent and truly important. The purpose of the RBNEP is to harness the enormous potential of evaluation analysis to alleviate poverty, improve the lives of Filipinos, ensuring that public policy projects and programs are informed by evidence, by data, and most of all, driven by results. It should be noted, of course, that no MNE system, results-based or otherwise, OECD-imposed or not, relies entirely upon the creation of an enabling environment that will allow independent, professionalized, and truly capacitated evaluators in the process. Truly, evaluation depends a great deal on good planning of ongoing activities. Certainly, good planning focuses on results, on implementation, on effectiveness. It has been said that the Philippines is too good at planning, over-planning to every degree, and yet fails in enforcement and collapses with implementation. How true is that, after all? Without proper planning that is based on data, that truly is projected, coming from evidence and information from the ground, without a clear description that is measurable and time-bound of objectives at every phase, of the scope of the intended results, it is not clear what we are monitoring and whatever we evaluate doesn't see the light of day. Whatever we evaluate fails to impact on the future of the project. This is where we need results-based management. I think your choice of the Philippine programs on nutrition is a particularly good area to start M&E. Certainly, it is time that we evaluate all these myriad efforts that are multidimensional indeed, very often even conflicting and in complete contrast to each other, approaches that in one way or other to some department or stakeholder appears to be a legitimate and viable uh, approach and yet in its result has been miserable. It has to be admitted. Despite decades and billions spent on nutrition by the national government, the reality is the World Bank sees childhood stunting as a critical economic problem to the development of the Philippines. As the chairman of the Economic Affairs Committee, nutrition and child stunting that results from the lack of it is certainly an economic developmental issue. To date, we uh, continue to see almost 30% of children between the ages of one to five years old being malnourished, resulting in a third of them um, being stunted, never mind the height and weight, but more importantly, permanently stunted in their brain development and growth. That is a tragic indictment for any nation. And yet, has the Philippines truly failed in its efforts? If you could bear with me, this after all is budget season. And looking at the budget and evaluating GAA 2020, one wonders why the child stunting and malnutrition numbers of the Philippines continue to dismay and disgrace this country. After all, we seem to be putting aside sufficient budget. Thus, recognizing the importance of um, evaluation and monitoring of data gathering and information analysis of uh, good results-based management, let us finally embark on a serious and committed evaluation policy for the Republic of the Philippines. It is time that we benchmark and measure against the global standards already provided by the OECD that have passed and been institutionalized to great effect in other countries. It is time that we bring about 
a better Philippines and with your help and your thoughtful solutions, your innovations and creative mandate, I am sure with uh, committed data gathering, um, great information analysis, and an evidence-driven planning framework, we will finally have a national evaluation system that the Philippines deserve. Congratulations, therefore, to CPBRD, to CEPO, for this National Evaluation Forum. The second time that I've been here, hopefully not the last, and do please provide me with the results of your conference so that we may be guided in the future. Let lawmaking and budget uh, financing be informed, enlightened, and inspired by your hard work. Thank you and good day. Thank you, Senator Aimi, for your message and for actively pushing the national evaluation policy. At this point, we would like to hear the message. Sorry. All right. We would like to hear from another champion of evaluation in the Senate, Senator Riza Ontiveros, who we all know as a health, women, and children's rights advocate. Senator Riza is the chair of the Senate Committee on Women, Children, Family Relations, and Gender Equality, and is also the author of Senate Bill Number no. 788, Establishing a National Evaluation Policy. Let us watch her video message. The National Evaluation Program is an important North Star for legislators and decision makers in our country. It helps us discern the sustainability and the efficiency of our policies and is the map to finding not just any way, but the right path to our goals. As the author of the National Evaluation Policy Bill, I urge that we continue to recognize this as a crucial step in shaping the legislative direction that our country will take to reach a level where policy affects and represents the most. Hindi isang salita lang ang batas. Walang planong dapat nakatagas sa bato. It must be an ongoing process of evaluation, recontextualization, adjustment, and transformation. I still believe in the institutionalization of such a process, and I'm glad that the forum continuously provides the space for important reflection. This year's theme is also close to my heart. I authored the first 1,000 Days Law, or the Kalusugan at Nutrisyon ng Magnanay Act, and it holds its importance now more than ever because of the dire need of nutrition in a time of historic hunger. The country maintains its position as part of the top 10 countries with the highest number of stunted children, an effect of malnutrition. The pandemic has only worsened this. Proper nutrition is crucial to the development of our children, the foundation of our health, and can prevent many succeeding illnesses. We know even better now that we are nothing without our health. If we are healthy, everything can follow. Health and economy, after all, are two sides of the same coin. Health truly is wealth, as the economy allows us to maintain it. Health is an important decision to make in any economic plan we have. It truly is direly consequential that we re-evaluate our nutrition plan, how it has been implemented, and how we can do what has never been done before to heal an historically painful moment in time. I hope that this year's NEP will be the North Star once more, especially in such an extraordinary time. May today be fruitful, and may today help us shine a light forward out of the shadows cast by a grave national issue para sa kalusugan at lagi para sa kapakanan ng taong bayan. Mabuhay kayo. Thank you to our women legislators. Now, before we go to our open forum, um, I, I think we can use some icebreaker first. Can you please go to your chat, uh, chat box and a link 
a Mentimeter link was posted there. Okay. Can you see it now? All right. So just click the link. And then enter the code 8537235. And in one word or phrase, key in what you think would be the benefit of having an institutionalized evaluation policy in the country. I, I think, okay. Was the link posted already? Okay. So please click the link and put in the code and then your answer. We will show you the results later. All right. Okay, so now we proceed to the open forum. And to moderate this session, may I call on Executive Director Merwin Salazar of the Senate Economic Planning Office. Okay, uh, thank you, Teta. Now we proceed to the open forum and we'll be in, we will be entertaining questions posted in the Q&A box of uh, our Zoom and then, and then we will also uh, read out some questions posted under the chat box. And if we have time, those questions that were answered uh, by our resource persons already, we'll be calling out also or reading out those questions um, for sharing of the uh, answers by the resource person. So now let me go first to the question posted by uh, Angie Bustas of the UP Los Banos. The question um, is, addressing is not only a concern of the local chief executives, the BNS and the B, uh, Barangay Health Workers. Did the evaluation look into who are the other nutrition key players and the local levels and how do you describe the current scope of involvement and performance of the rules? Any evaluation on this perspective? Perhaps we can call on um, um, Peter Shruji to answer the question. Yeah, so that's a good question. And, and we did, um... We did interview other actors. So I, I think I mentioned we also interviewed nutrition action officers um, at each level. Um, we also interviewed midwives and, and nurses um, and really anyone who said that they were basically involved in nutrition programming and implementation, we, we interviewed them. Um, in terms of some of the findings, I, I think I mentioned in terms of the nutrition action officers, um, of course, there's, there's a lot of variation in terms of performance. Uh, but um, as I mentioned, kind of one of the main takeaways uh, that we got from those interviews was that um, what could really help them improve uh, their performance would be creating plantilla positions. So um, one example would be one uh, M now who was um, an MHO uh, was basically telling us that he doesn't really have time um, to, to monitor implementation and, and assess progress of the implementation of the PPEN, that he usually works late into the night working. Um, and although he would like to, he just didn't really have the time. And so he recommended um, having a plantilla position, which um, I think as one of our um, participants noted, this isn't really something new. Um, it's something that's been really advocated for a while. And those that who were advocating for it were just uh, saying, you know, if we, if we really want to improve the nutrition situation, then we need to make investments in human resources, which I think has also been a, a common theme. Um, in terms of um, interviewing other actors at the barangay level, for example, uh, midwives. I think one, one common thing we, we saw there also was still that kind of clinical orientation towards treating um, acute malnutrition over chronic malnutrition. So that was kind of a trend that we see across um, barangay level actors there. Um, we, we also interviewed, as I mentioned, uh, nutrition actors at the central office, policymakers um, at the regional level, those who are coordinating um, efforts at the, the regionals and provincial levels as well. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Peter. Um, there's a, um, 
another question relev uh, relevant to the uh, earlier question by Angie, and it says that um, having a plantilla position for local nutrition action officers has been recognized for many years. Do you think this can be uh, personalized? Perhaps we can also call on uh, our resource uh, reactors from the NNC, National Nutrition Council, and PNR, FNRI to answer the question. Yes, I'll, I'll refer this question to, to Dr. Daeng Hirang and Dr. Okay. Anha. I myself was once a city nutrition action officer in Davao, way back in year 1990 to 1995 under the city mayor Rodrigo Duterte. And um, Davao City itself uh, really has a nutrition office in particular. So long, even, even even before the, the creation, no, after the creation of the National Nutrition Council, it really advocated for the, the creation of plantilla positions for NAUS. And year by year, we have evaluated uh, our local government units, and we can see the increasing um, number of LGUs having plantilla positions. And to name a few, we have uh, exemplary LGUs who have hired full-time nows, such as, as I said, Dabo City, Osami City, Sambuanga Sibugay, Valencia City, and to name a few. And these are backed up by appropriate staff and office complements and institutional ordinances. And uh, since NNC has already um, coordinated well with coordinated well with the leagues of uh, our ULAP, no? our union uh, leagues, or like the local authorities, like the LPP, leagues of provinces, leagues of uh, Philippine Councilors League, League of Mayors and Cities. So we have really advocated that for them to, you know, sustain uh, a good nutrition program, better nutrition program year by year, they should, uh, I mean, create plantilla positions. So, and side by side, NNC also coordinated with the DILG for the local government code to be amended. Because in, in uh, the national or, or the nutrition action officer position is not a mandatory position, unlike other positions is stated in the local government code. And this time we are very hopeful that the ILG will really include uh, nutrition action officers as one of the mandatory positions with uh, its uh, revision. So that is my hope and my challenge also to LGUs even before the, the I mean, the revision, uh, LGUs will be able to really recruit and then have their volunteer positions open to all the nutrition action officers. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian uh, Hirang. Um, Another question related to that um, is from Ms. Arlene Season from the Senate Economic Planning Office. The study seeks to understand to what degree LGUs have applied the PIPAN 2017-2022 strategic thrust in nutrition programming. However, based on the previous on, on the presentations this morning, aware of the programs and, and even the PIPAN itself. What could be the reasons for the lack of awareness of some local government offices or local government officials? Has it something to do with the cascading of the plan to the local government, uh, to the local governments? What are the recommendations in order to raise awareness of the LGUs on the PIPAN? Um, may we also call again uh, Dr. Liang Hirang or Dr. Uh, Agdepa and perhaps uh, Peter Shruji could also enlighten us uh, based on the results of the uh, study. Okay, so um, actually the lack of awareness is relative to the prioritization of programs at the LGU level. And uh, most uh, local chief executives would focus on, sad to say, infrastructure projects. But in recent years, there have been a significant development on increasing focus for development programs that 
are aimed at developing human resources and capabilities. So most LCEs that are nutrition champions actually exhibit their political will and investments in nutrition because for them, good governance is good nutrition. And uh, also um, buy-in for nutrition is focused on actually addressing stunting and um, its impact on child development in terms of the school performance of a child and its labor productivity in later life. And these local chief executives that have been aware of these problems really invested in the implementation of PIPAN programs such as the first 1,000 days and that uh, they have really appreciated that investments in nutrition which is good governance, no? So this is particularly the case of Quezon Province, like right? uh, Governor J.J. Suarez in particular, and Quirino Province, Province uh, uh, Congressman Pua, now uh, who's the father of the, the, the provincial governor of Quirino Province, also Dr. Pua, who really put uh, nutrition in as one of the major programs of their administration. Thank you. Back to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Liang Hirang. There's yes. a question related to that, and perhaps we, 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 it's, it would be um, uh, tiny if we will answer the question also. Uh, it says that, this is from Maria Teresa Talavera. It says that the um, findings of the study showed the need for empowerment at the local level. How about at the national level? Did the research look at this aspect too? Perhaps um, Mr. Peter Shruji could answer the question. Sure, so um, I guess my question would be, what exactly you mean by, by empowerment at, at the national level? But um, I think it does kind of get at a key question here and, and especially it's a, it's a question, you know, that, or a challenge that, that the NNC I'm sure faces in the sense that of course, nutrition governance is decentralized in the Philippines. So there, you know, there's limitations to what they can actually do to, to change these outcomes. So um, of course they can equip LGUs and provide the technical assistance they need to really um, meet the new nutrition needs of um, their, their populations. Um, and of course they can try to incentivize them um, to, um, to focus on um, nutritional concerns. Um, so I, I think your question is sort of what else um, can the national level do to really um, to um, improve these outcomes given kind of these limitations, um, if I'm understanding this correctly. Um, and I think in terms of, of what they can do, in terms of the recommendations that we've made, I think there are still a number of things that, that can be done and that are being done um, by the NNC and other actors in terms of um, providing more technical assistance and, and the right incentives so that uh, um, LGUs are, are properly incentivized to, to look at uh, or to, to focus more on nutrition governance. Um, and going back to evaluations, one key question there is, um, you know, whether it's actually achieving, um, you know, the intended goals. So, uh, for example, the, the MELPI awards or um, certain trainings, uh, the cascading approach and, and whether that training is working versus having more direct trainings for uh, the barangays. I think these are all things that could be um, subject to evaluation and we can evaluate the cost effectiveness um, of different approaches um, to see which ones work. And I think in that sense, um, that can be empowering um, to really have a, a good sense of um, to what degree are our programs working and if they're not, um, why? And then we can, we can know where to improve. Thank you, uh, uh, Peter. We received also a question from the Director General of the CPBRD of the House of Representatives, um, um, Dr. June Amiral. Uh, would you like to ask the question yourself? Sir? Are you still there, uh, Dr. Miral? Yes, yes, um, Mervin, thank you. And, well, Peter, thank you very much uh, for the study. Uh, it's a uh, very insightful. 
Uh, I have a, a number of questions. My first question actually is um, uh, about the relevance criteria, which I think is very important. Uh, but uh, in the consideration of the relevance criteria, it focused mainly on the implementers of the program. So I'm just wondering whether the uh, perceptions or the perspectives of the uh, program beneficiaries uh, should have been considered also in uh, looking at the relevance criteria of the program. Um, the other question is about the cascading, uh, the, pro the limitation of the cascading approach. Uh, and uh, the, the recommendation on the focus at the, bar uh, at the barangay. Um, my, my question is, um, because this cascading approach is somehow connected to the uh, multi-level uh, local government uh, system that we have. So I'm just wondering whether the presence of this uh, multi-level, uh, several levels of local government uh, with overlapping territories and uh, overlap, overlapping constituencies, uh, really is a, a big contributor to this cascading, uh, to the cascading problem, as well as to issues about accountability, duplication, and so on. So I'm just wondering uh, if there's any uh, cross-country study that look into this matter about uh, the uh, involvement of the local government uh, in, in, in the process and uh, how, how to address this issue of uh, several layers or several levels of, uh, uh, of local government levels. Uh, I think uh, that's it for, uh, for the meantime. Thank you very much again for the study. Maybe call on uh, Peter Suruji to answer the question and the other reactors as well, if they have uh, 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 insights on the question of Dr. Miral. Yes, thank you very much for those questions. Um, very good question. So um, regarding beneficiaries, we actually did also interview beneficiaries too. Um, so we primarily interviewed uh, mothers of, of young children, um, asked them and asked them about their perceptions of um, nutrition, their understanding of stunting and their experiences with the programs. Um, in terms of relevance, um, that's where, where I mentioned, you know, the majority of community members actually, you know, weren't familiar with stunting, um, didn't see, um, you know, being short as a medical problem. Uh, typically, you know, would say the typical response would be, you know, Filipinos are, are just short. Um, and it, so that was kind of the typical response we, we got from beneficiaries. There was a very low level of understanding um, of, of stunting and chronic uh, malnutrition. Um, in terms of the, the cascading approach and its limitations, um, so, so I think you're right. I don't think the cascading approach in itself um, is flawed. Um, I think you're right that um, there's kind of overlapping concerns there. So it's, it's the cascading approach as it relates to um, human resources, let's say, and, and the organizational structure at these lower levels. So, um, and, and this is how it was described to us, at least um, through our interviews, that um, when you're relying on designated positions, when you're relying, uh, relying on just a, a cadre of, of volunteers, at the lowest levels, um, the cascading approach then has um, some limitations there. Um, and so the interaction of these, these two things is where we, we really see the cascading approach um, not working in some scenarios. But of course we do see it also working in, in other scenarios, um, especially where there's um, a high level of interest among LCEs um, in um, nutrition programming, um, where there's plantilla positions, where there are staff that uh, have the staff and, uh, sorry, have the, the time and know-how to actually implement uh, the PPAN and monitor um, the staff below them, we see that the cascading approach, uh, it does work. Even if it is slow, um, given resource limitations, it can work under some scenarios. But where it doesn't work, we, we see it has to do with kind of the organizational structures at the, the lower levels and, and human resources. Um, in terms of a cross-country study that would look at governance 
in terms of um, this kind of setup, um, nothing particularly comes to mind, um, but it, it is not unusual, at least um, at like the village level, let's say, um, to be relying on a cadre of volunteers, um, such as the bar barangay health work care workers, uh, health workers, sorry, um, or barangay nutrition scholars. So that's that's not unusual, and there have been studies on um, you know how best to to recruit and, and incentivize these these personnel, and even at the level of like a munis municipal nutrition action officer. Um, uh, the, there was a study in, in Zambia and sort of how best to recruit um, uh, staff and whether to appeal to uh, professional development versus um, altruism and uh, providing their community, providing to their communities. But um, I mean, that's just kind of one small example. But in terms of nutrition governance in general at the lower levels, I'm, I'm sure there are, but nothing is really coming to mind uh, as it relates specifically to the Philippines, but I'm sure Dr. Uh, Dayang Hirang or, or Dr. Angeles um, Agdepa could um, provide more insights there. Yes, hello, good morning. Uh, good morning once again. Thank you, Peter, for that enlightenment. Uh, I agree with Dr. Dayang Hirang a while ago when she was saying that there should be really a hiring of a uh, specific uh, personnel or manpower at the local level to man the nutrition programs in the community. I know very well that Dr. Diane Hira is pushing this very much uh, to the local levels. And I, we do hope also that this will be actually supported by our Senate or the Congress to push forward for some sort of, uh, of amending the law. And uh, this is actually one way to solve the problem of misconceptions, uh, cascading as you are saying, and also um, the so uh, we can also solve governance. Why? Just because there is this specific person already pushing for nutrition at the grassroots uh, level. Now for her to be really there is really a uh, very uh, important approach to solve all these kind of misconceptions down the line. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Agdepa. Um, Dr. Dayang here, would you like to answer the question? Okay, sir. At the local government levels, uh, indeed the focus should be at the barangay level. No? So, however, the province as the apex local government should provide program augmentation also for nutrition. And uh, that the cities and the municipalities should be the lead LGUs in terms of program implementation. Because uh, in particular, cities and municipalities uh, are, uh, the, the, the barangays themselves are constituents of the municipalities and cities. And these barangays are where the malnourished children are located or situated. So on the other hand, investments for nutrition should be present in all of these LGUs. So, uh, and also the Human Development Poverty Reduction Cluster, uh, determination of focus areas are primarily based on stunting, poverty, and prevalence of teenage pregnancies, which makes for a clear basis for program investments and in that uh, the delineation of functions as clearly pointed out in the study is affirmed by the National Nutrition Council. This is so because the PIPAN calls for a sustained leadership both at the national and local levels and that the need to mobilize stakeholders across different sectors and that convergence of programs should be both vertical as well as horizontal. So thank you and back to you, sir. Thank you, uh, our, uh, Dr. Dayang Hirang, Agdepa, and Peter. Now, I, uh, in the interest of time, I think we can call one more uh, question and uh, we'll pursue it with the rest of the program. May we call on Ms. Desiree Guash of the Office of Senator Zubiri to ask uh, your remaining question, which, which has, hasn't been answered yet by our resource persons. 
Are you there, uh, Miss Desiree? Des, are you still there? Uh, so if uh, she isn't around, um, may I just read out uh, her question? Uh, may we know if there are studies correlating hunger, malnutrition to jurisdictions, provinces, like provinces, towns, or cities with number one, uh, factor high resistance to agrarian reform, number two, in areas with large patents for grazing and pasture lands, riverbank and coastal communities, it is so sad that in many such communities, the households are not allowed to use portions of the rich agricultural land for cultivating food crops and the cattle area are raised and cattle are raised in the old style of ranging, thus overrunning food crops of farm or ranch workers. The same malnutrition hunger issues occur in coastal communities since people are forced to live near the shores prone to disasters because land for safe housing projects have been gobbled up by the rich. Besides, they seek to live near the shores of river banks because they have a source of food that is free. The poor are edged out of productive and safe land. So would you like to answer, uh, Peter? So I, I think it's fairly well established, um, and there have been a number of, of studies here in the Philippines um, that at least just generally, um, access to um, cheap and healthy foods are, are key to improving um, nutrition um, and dietary diversity is especially important. So um, anything that would uh, you know, prevent access to um, a nutritious variety of foods that are, are needed, um, you would imagine would, would likely affect um, nutrition outcomes. And so um, access to land might be, be one of those issues. And, and I know um, the Department of Agrarian Reform was working with the DA and DSWD, um, uh, it was a few years ago, and I think the program is still ongoing um, in terms of um, trying to improve access to nutritious foods by um, organizing um, agrarian reform communities um, to build community gardens so that they could have access to nutritious, nutritious foods. And then the idea is if they had a surplus that they could sell that, that food in the market um, or to um, daycare centers. Um, so I think it's, it's been well recognized that um, access is really key to improving um, nutrition and, the, and there have been programs to try to address that. Um, and then of course, disasters um, are also a factor that um, can, um, can contribute to, to poor nutrition. Um, and as you mentioned, um, you know, disasters living by the coast, flooding, typhoons, um, they can also contribute to um, diseases that, that can affect uh, nutrition intake uh, and, and increase malnutrition in certain areas. Um, so these have been established by studies and, and the PPAN actually acknowledges this too, um, that uh, disaster response is also um, a component to consider when um, when implementing, um, when trying to improve nutrition outcomes. Thank you, Peter. Um, okay, we will accommodate one more last question from the office of uh, Representative Joy Myra Tambunting of the second, second district of Paranaque. Um, maybe call on the person who raised uh, his or her hand from the office of Congress, uh, Congressperson Tambunting to speak up. Are you there from the office of uh, Representative Tambunting of Paranaque? Hello, uh, you have been unmuted already. You can speak up now. Okay, since... Um... Marine, can I share? 
Sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, hello, Merwin. I just like to ask while waiting for the for the uh, question of uh, the representative from Paranaque. Uh, while uh, in addition to uh, Peter's uh, explanation a while ago regarding uh, the research on this uh, the connection of climate disaster and uh, other factors to malnutrition. Actually, the National Nutrition Survey has a provincial estimate, and therefore, uh, we reveal uh, the nutritional status of uh, children and across all population groups per provincial uh, data. And therefore, uh, they can we can already assess whether that province has a high malnutrition rate or not. So uh, it is a very localized uh, survey already, which uh, uh, provincial planners can actually use it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Agdepa. Is the uh, results of the survey available already? Uh, currently, we are disseminating the results of the provincial uh, data uh, to our uh, provincial uh, uh, stakeholders. So uh, we have finished already about 21 uh, provinces. Uh, in 2019, we covered 39. So now we only have 19 more remaining. Uh, for dissemination until the midweek of uh, November. Okay, so um, perhaps you, if we, you can also disseminate the results of the survey to other um, agencies in government and to other stakeholders um, uh, in, in, in the country so that we would be able to, to get some um, information from the survey and perhaps we could use it in our um, uh, policy uh, formulation. Yes, uh, we have done actually the national presentation last August, August 4, for the 2019 National Nutrition Survey results. And it is already all the results and presentations are already posted in our website for consumption of other agencies. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Agdepa. Um, we have, we received so many questions and some of those questions were answered already by our resource person and the other reactors. And those, that, those questions that we won't be able to read out this morning, we will be uh, giving them to the resource person and to the reactors so that they would be able to answer them. And rest assured, since we have your email now, uh, addresses, we would send them the answers to questions uh, to you uh, as soon as we get them. Now, um, uh, thank you for such an animated uh, question and answer. Thank you for the uh, perceptive and um, keen questions from our participants. And thank you also for the uh, good insights from our and ideas from our uh, resource persons. Now I would like to turn you over to uh, Director Teta Pardalis for the remaining of the program. Thank you so much, Mervyn, for moderating the Q&A. Uh, we will take note of all your questions, also especially those who were, who were, what, which were posted on Facebook. And we will be sending them to our resource speakers for them to answer. OK. We will be showing in the screen right now the result of the Mentimeter question earlier. Are you seeing it now? Okay, so this is called a word cloud, and these are all your answers. So the bigger the word, the more people put that in as their answer. So most of the participants think that the main advantage of a national evaluation law is accountability and efficiency. So yes, a national evaluation policy does help ensure accountability and efficiency because it will provide us information. Uh, where we are in our programs, what are the bottlenecks, where we are, whether we are achieving our objectives. And then some also said it would provide learnings. Yes, because the results of evaluation could be used um, to improve not just the design or implementation of that particular project, but also critical insights for future policies and programs. Okay, so and speaking of lessons, I just want to remind the participants to please do not forget to answer our feedback forms, which will be um, sent to you later so we can learn and improve our future webinars. At, at this juncture, we would like to express our sincerest thanks to all our resource persons. We've certainly learned a lot from you today. 
um, we know that this is not much, but please allow us to present to you our certificates of appreciation. Allow me to read the citation. These certificates of appreciation are given to Mr. Peter Sruji, Dr. Azuzena Dayanghirang, Dr. Crystal Haijing Huang for imparting their invaluable time, knowledge, and insights during the webinar entitled Evaluating the Philippine Plan of Action for Nutrition, the second of knowledge of the Knowledge Sharing Forum series on evaluation studies as resource speakers. Given this third day of November 2020, Senate of the Philippines, Pasay City, signed Romulo Emanuel Miral, Jr., PhD, Director General, CPBRD, and Mr. Ronald Argold being Director General, CEPO. Once again, thank you to all our panelists. But before we part ways, um, may, may we request everyone to turn on our videos? So we could have our pictures taken with our resource persons. Okay. Let's just wait for the others to turn on their videos. <laughs> All right. Okay. So smile, everyone. Okay. Thank you. And to formally conclude this activity, let me call on Mr. Ronald R. Golding, Director General of the Senate Economic Planning Office, to give his closing remarks. Senator Aimee Marcos, Chairperson of the Senate Committee on Economic Affairs. Senator Risa Ontiveros. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Senator Amy Marcos, Chairperson of the Senate Committee on Economic Affairs, Senator Risa Hentoveros, Chairperson of the Committee on Women, Children, Family Relations, and Gender Equality, Congressman Alfred Vargas of the 5th District of Quezon City, our... Can you hear me? Our development partner, our colleagues from the house, from the both houses of Congress, STEAM, resource person, and reactors, stakeholders from the government and the private sector, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of the Senate Economic Planning Office, together with our counterpart in the House of Representatives, the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department. I would like to thank you all for your continuing support to this activity and for making this National Evaluation Forum a very productive one. We thank you for your active participation, for sharing with us your insights, and for offering our, your comments and suggestions on how we can further improve the Philippine Plan for, of Action for, nut for Nutrition in general. I would like to thank in particular the GOP UNICEF for the technical assistance extended to the Philippine Congress as its partner in the conduct of knowledge sharing forum series on evaluation and specifically commissioned by the National Economic Development Authority. Through this forum, the UNICEF has partnered with us once again in our, in our advocacy efforts to reach out to our many stakeholders and convince them and the necessity for both government and private sector to realize the importance of a national evaluation policy for better development outcomes in our country. As we entered the fourth industrial revolution and digitization, information has become the most essential tool in, this, in decision making in both the government and the private se sector. We firmly believe it is high time our government recognize that monitoring and evaluation is indispensable towards better governance and towards a well-informed Philippine society. I trust that this forum brought forth an appreciation for a national evaluation policy that would mandate all agencies in the public sector to use regular, systemic, and credible policy and program evaluation with the end in view of improving public services development delivery. In closing, we hope to see you all again in the next stage 
of the National Evaluation Policy Forum series. Again, thank you very much and mabuhay. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Sir Ronald. Once again, thank you to all the panelists and all the attendees for your active participation. Um, please don't forget <laughs> to fill in the evaluation form so that you can get your certificates of participation. The link is already in the chat box. And we will also email them to you. Thank you, and we look forward to having you again in our future webinars. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. These are all the offices that participated in our webinar today. Thank you so much. Thanks very much.